In this video, we're going to calculate where in our planetary system we should place our primary inhabited planet. To do this, we're going to use a parameter known as the planet's stellar irradiance. Stellar irradiance is just the energy being emitted from the star as measured at some distance away. In this case, the distance at which your planet will orbit. The closer a planet orbits to its parent star, the more energy it will receive and the hotter its climate will tend to be. The farther it orbits away from the parent star, the less energy it will receive and the colder its climate will tend to be. I say tend because the specifics of a planet's surface and atmosphere can alter this relationship considerably. That's why Venus is so much hotter than Mercury, even though Mercury is far closer to the Sun. But since we have yet to define the necessary surface and atmospheric properties of our planet, we're going to have to be very careful with the amount of stellar irradiance that we give our planet. A good starting point is always Earth's stellar irradiance of 1,361 watts per square meter. Obviously, it shouldn't be exactly this value, but it should be close, especially if you want your planet to be habitable to humans. In that case, I would recommend you place your planet within the range of 1,100 to 1,400 watts per square meter. If you want your planet to possess liquid water on its surface, but not necessarily be habitable to humans, then you can extend that range from 725 to 1500 watts per square meter, which represents the outer and inner bounds of your star's habitable zone, respectively. Be very careful getting too close to these values, though, as they are based on estimates of the planet's surface and atmospheric properties. So if your planet's surface and atmospheric properties differ by too much from these estimates, it may end up unable to support liquid water on its surface. Once we have chosen our planet's stellar irradiance value, we can calculate at what distance our planets would receive that much energy from their star. To do that, we can use this equation which relates the square of the orbital distance to the star's luminosity divided by 4 pi times the chosen stellar irradiance. I've chosen a value of 1,248 watts per square meter for my planet's stellar irradiance, so I'm going to add that to my SAP sheet before we continue. Then I'm going to pull up my calculator and open a parentheses. Enter my star's luminosity, which was defined earlier as 2.5858 times 10 to the 26 watts. Close the parentheses, divide, and open another parentheses. Then enter 4 pi times 1,248 watts per square meter. Then I close the parentheses. Your equation should look something like this. I'll press equals and then raise this value to a power of 1 over 2 to get the square root as so. This gives my planet an orbital distance of 128,405,977,376 meters. So I'm going to add that to my SAP sheet. Now if you're doing a simple build, you can label this parameter as your planet's orbital distance. But if you're doing a detailed build and plan to define parameters such as your planet's eccentricity, uh, periapsis, apoapsis, etc., then you should instead label it as the semi-major axis. Before we move on, I would like to convert my distance value into astronomical units, that is, multiples of Earth's distance from the Sun. To do that, we can simply divide our distance value by 149,597,800,000 700 meters. This gives me a value of 0.8583 astronomical units. Now that we know our planet's average orbital distance, we can calculate its orbital period using Kepler's third law of planetary motion. Now I know this equation looks a bit intimidating, and it does fill out a calculator screen, so I'm going to break it up into three simpler equations to make things a bit easier on us. The first equation is this, which relates the gravitational mass of our objects to the gravitational constant times the mass of our star plus the mass of our planet. So let's pull up the calculator and enter the gravitational constant in parentheses. 6.6743 times 10 to the power of negative 11. Then I'll multiply that by, open two parentheses, the mass of my star, which is 1.8023 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Close one of the parentheses plus, open another parentheses, and put the mass of my planet, which is 6.6906 
times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Then I'll close both my parentheses. Your equation should look something like this. I press equals and I get a value of 1.2029136 times 10 to the power of 20. Now there's no need to write this down on your SAP sheet. We just need it on the screen for the next equation, which is this one, which relates the square of our planet's mean orbital velocity to the gravitational mass that we just calculated divided by the distance our planet orbits at. So I'm just going to press divide and then enter my planet's orbital distance. 128,405,977,376 meters. I'm then going to press equals and get the square root of this number by raising it to a power of one over two. This gives me a mean orbital velocity value of 30,607.27 meters per second which I'm going to add to my SAP sheet. Now, this is just an optional parameter, so you don't need to add it if you don't want it. In this, our final equation segment, our planet's orbital period is going to be equal to the circumference of its orbit, which is just two pi times our planet's orbital distance, divided by the mean orbital velocity that we just calculated. So, I'm going to clear my calculator, then enter two pi times my orbital distance of 128 billion 405,977,376 meters. Then I'm going to divide that by my mean orbital velocity, which I can either copy off my SAP sheet or retrieve by pressing the history button and grabbing it off the list. Your equation should then look something like this. I press equals and there is my planet's orbital period in seconds. So I'm going to add that to my SAP sheet. You don't have to get the numbers past the decimal point if you don't want to. It is just a fraction of a second after all, but if you want to keep really accurate track of time on your planet, then you'll need to. Now that we have our orbital period in seconds, let's make it a bit more understandable by converting it into days. To do that, we just divide our value by 86,400, which is the number of seconds in a day. This gives my planet an orbital period of approximately 305 days. Well, 305 Earth days. We'll have to wait until we've defined our planet's synodic rotation period before we can determine how many local days that is. But we'll cover that in my next video. I hope you will join me for that.